science teacher for 15 years, and now for the last 10 years, I've been traveling around the world speaking on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Let me give you a quick review of what we covered so far in the seminar. Since this is going to be what's on videotape number seven, <clears throat> we've already covered a lot of other material. We'll just give a real fast review. The Bible teaches that God made the entire universe in six days, about 6,000 years ago. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood that destroyed the world when Noah built the ark and saved all the critters on board. Before the flood came, um, <clears throat> the animals and people lived a long time. People lived over 900 years. We cover all that on videotape number one and number two, you know, how to prove the earth is not billions of years old, and how do you live to be 900 years <laughs> old, and you can't do that today, by the way. And then we cover on videotape number three about the dinosaurs, how they've always lived with man. They've been mentioned in the Bible. They're mentioned all through history, and there's probably some still alive. So if you didn't get to watch those, you'd want to get, to, you'd want to get one of my catalogs of all my material, which is not copyrighted, or get some videotapes. They'd go uh, 15 hours altogether in the uh, seminar where we answer all these questions. On tape number four, we talk about lies in the textbooks things that kids are exposed to in school that just simply are not true anymore. Just plain lies in order to get them to believe in the evolution theory. Then on tape five, we talk about how this evolution theory has been responsible for the rise of communism, socialism, Marxism, the new world order, kind of the political implications. And then on tape number six, we talk about the flood. What was that flood like? What did it do? How Grand Canyon was formed very quickly? So tonight we're gonna fill in the questions that we did not get to cover. I save some of the technical stuff for last because uh, I want to keep the kids' attention <clears throat> as long as possible. So we're going to cover some of these things here. Our job, one of our jobs as a Christian is to apply our heart to know. We should study to show ourselves approved unto God. Our job is to be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us. And what we want to do tonight to show that we, we Christians can study and understand what this world is like. Christians often get accused of leaving their mind at the door when they walk into the church. Now, I, for one, resent that, and I think most of you do too. I think a lot of atheists have this smarter than thou attitude. You know, you believe the Bible, you must be dumb. Well, I'd say if you don't believe the Bible, something's wrong with you. <clears> There's <throat> certainly never been anything in that book proven to be false, and uh, a lot of lives have been changed by that book, including mine. <clears throat> so let's take a few questions here. One question I frequently get asked, and by the way, if you didn't get time to turn it in, during the break you can turn in questions. I've got quite a stack of them here. Just write your question out. We'll get to as many as we can here tonight. How do we see the stars that are billions of light years away? <clears throat> this is a question that gets asked almost every seminar I do. How do we see these stars billions of light years away? There's no question there are an awful lot of stars out there. And I love going out and studying the stars. I taught earth science for years and had did sections on astronomy. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, God created the stars for them to be for signs and for seasons. So the reason God made them was so Adam could see them, right? It wouldn't be very smart for God to make something Adam couldn't see for millions of years, okay? So he made them for Adam to see them. It has been estimated there are probably enough stars out there right now that every person on earth could have two trillion of them to themselves. <laughs> Plenty to go around, okay? So what about the stars? How do we see the stars? Actually, even atheists like Stephen Hawkins, Hawking will say, stars are so very far away they appear to us to be just pinpoints of light. We cannot see their size or shape, so how can we tell the different types of stars apart? For the vast majority of stars, there is only one characteristic feature we can observe, the color of their light. You cannot see how big these stars are. All you see is what color light they produce. If you get the biggest telescope in the world and look at the closest star, all you see is a dot. Before they put Hubble up there, somebody said, Brother Hovind, are you nervous when they put Hubble up, it's going to prove evolution? I said, oh, I can tell you exactly what they're going to find when they put the Hubble telescope up there. He said, what? I said, they're going to find more stars. <laughs> That's exactly what they found. Lots more stars. We have an awfully big God. So what about these stars anyway? Well, if you're going to measure the distance to an object you cannot touch, you have to use what's called trigonometry. How many had trigonometry in school? Okay, I taught trig for years. I loved the course. You finally get to something practical when you get to trigonometry. You know, you're in algebra, and you're, where are you going to use this? And the students are saying, when am I going to need this? And I hate to tell them, you probably won't. But, <laughs> but you will use it this Friday on the test. <laughs> but in trigonometry, if you're going to measure the distance to an object you can't touch, you have to have two observation points and know the distance between the points and measure the angles. And it's not that complicated. I teach anybody, you know, trig pretty quickly. It's the basics of trigonometry. 
You have the sine, cosine, tangent. Those are the three major functions, and there are several others. But what about measuring the distance to these stars? Well, if you want to find the distance to a star, you obviously can't go touch it. So how do you measure the distance? What they've done to get two people away from each other as far as possible, if you put them on opposite sides of the Earth to look at the star, you have enlarged the base of your triangle. The problem is the Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter, which is nothing compared to star distance. So we need to get a bigger base on the triangle somehow. So to compensate for this, they have decided we're going to look at the star in January, and then we're going to wait six months till we've gone halfway around the sun and look at the star in June, and we now have a huge base on the triangle. Earth's orbit around the sun makes a gigantic circle. However, it is still only 16 light minutes in diameter. Instead of using the big numbers of miles, let's change it all to light minutes so it makes sense. From Earth to Sun is eight light minutes. It takes light eight minutes to go that far. So the diameter is 16 light minutes. The problem with this is one year has 525,948 minutes in it. So if you're going to look at a star one light year away, and none of them are that close, but if you were going to look at a star one light year away from opposite sides of Earth's orbit, let's convert it all to inches so it makes sense. 16 inches, you put your two surveyors 16 inches apart. They have real powerful telescopes. They're focused in on the star. The star is 525,948 inches away, which converts to eight and a quarter miles. If you put two guys on the roof of this church, with telescopes, and they were 16 inches apart, and they were looking at a dot eight and a quarter miles away. Would you agree that would form a very skinny triangle? <laughs> okay? That is to measure one light year. That is using Earth's orbit around the sun as a base, which is very generous. That makes an angle of 0 0.017 degrees. If you want to measure 100 light years, you now have to move your dot 826 miles away. The surveyors are still 16 inches apart. I would like to point out that's difficult to measure those kind of angles. Also, I think it's kind of difficult to tell exactly where you were six months ago on opposite sides of Earth's orbit. I mean, don't you think that would be just a little bit of a stretch to know exactly where you were? Because you have to get really precise now. We're talking really tiny numbers. So you simply cannot measure the distance to the stars, okay? We can't do it. This textbook says they can measure 100 light years. Okay, I doubt it, but I'll give them 100. I'll give them 500 if they quit crying. The fact is you can't measure 10 billion. Congress doesn't know it, but there's a difference between 100 and 10 billion, okay? <laughs> so, number one, we cannot measure the distances. They might be billions of light years away. I don't know, and you don't know, and nobody knows how far away they are. They could be. We don't know. Secondly, we don't know that light always travels at the same speed. We don't even know what light is. Is it a wave, a photon, a particle? Nobody knows what light is. We know what it does, and we use it all the time, but nobody knows the basic characteristic, what is light? And we certainly do not know that it's always traveled the same speed. As a matter of fact, the whole idea behind a black hole is the idea that light can be affected by gravity, in which case it could be stopped if you get enough gravity, and so obviously the speed of light is not a constant. A Danish physicist in 99 slowed light down in his laboratory to 38 miles an hour. Hmm, pretty interesting. I don't think the speed of light is a constant. By the way, the way they measure the speed of light is using the atomic clock. Uh, one uh, astronomer, Setterfield or Setter White, I forgot his name now, uh, he, he, did, he noticed the speed of light was declining. All the numbers recorded by the ancient, you know, from the last hundred years or so, everybody's number was getting a little smaller. He graphed it out. He said the speed of light has been declining for the last hundred years, but it stopped declining in about 62, 1962. Well, that's when they started using the atomic clock as the base to measure the speed of light. Well, want to hold it. If the atomic clock uses the wavelength of a cesium-133 atom, then if the speed of light is slowing down, your clock is slowing down at the same rate. So you have a rubber ruler. <laughs> so no wonder they're not noticing any more decline in the speed of light. Okay, they're using light to measure light. Um, thirdly, the creation was finished. It was mature when God was done. God didn't make two babies and put them in the Garden of Eden and hand them a package of seeds and say, plant these quick, you're going to need supper. Okay? <laughs> he had two full-grown people in a full-grown garden. Everything was mature. The trees were full-grown. The 
plants already had fruit on them, Adam and Eve were full grown, and the light from the stars was already showing. Amen. See, the problem we have, we humans are very uh, common, uh, prone to do this, we try to put our limitations on God. We can only be one place at a time, so we assume God can only be one place at a time. Major error in logic. We assume, you know, God can only do the things that we can do. Well, listen, I wouldn't worship a God that was only that big. The God that I worship is infinite, all-powerful, all-wise, almighty, can do everything. He is omnipotent and omnipresent. He knows it all, he sees it all, and he loves us anyway. Whew, what a nice guy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Praise God for his mercy. So people say, what about the red shift? Doesn't that prove the stars are billions of light years away? Well, the idea behind the red shift is pretty interesting. When light goes through a prism, it breaks up into the colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. This spectrum that it makes, when they look at a star, they notice the spectrum has the red is shifted over from where it is supposed to be, which is where they get the name red shift. So they think maybe they can tell the distance to the stars if the red shift is an indication of the Doppler effect. We know that the Doppler effect will affect sound. When a train is coming toward you, it pushes the sound waves closer together, and the pitch is higher. You hear the train coming in, the pitch drops as it goes past you. This is called the Doppler effect. So the theory goes, maybe the stars are racing away so fast, the light coming toward us will be spread out by the Doppler effect. Interesting theory, not proven. Nobody knows for sure what is causing the red shift. It may be the Doppler effect. However, the experts will tell you, there was an early sign that red shifts indicate distance to galaxies. Quasars, uh, for quasars they're called. However, the diagram shows wide scatter in apparent brightness at every red shift. In fact, there is little correlation of brightness to redshift at all. Either quasars come in an extremely wide range of intrinsic luminosities, that's their brightness, as most people believe, or their redshifts do not indicate distance. If somebody tells you we know the distance to that star because of the redshift, I'm sorry, you don't either know the distance to those stars. We just can't tell the difference. The canopy of water above the earth before the earth was destroyed by this big flood might have made it even easier to see the stars. There's been some interesting research done on a layer of ice. Uh, if you had a layer of ice above the earth, it would be a photo optic, a photo amplifier. Like Adam could probably see the stars better than we can with this layer of ice. For one thing, if the atmosphere was compressed to 10 or 12 miles instead of 100 miles, it wouldn't affect us down here much except breathing would be easier. But now you'd have less atmospheric distortion from the compressed atmosphere. You know how the, you know, the stars twinkle? Well, when you get out beyond the atmosphere, they don't twinkle. You just see the dots. So the redshift does not indicate distance. This, uh, in Science News, they said, another set of observations indicates that the universe appears to be 8.4 to 10.6 billion years. The new work relied on the Hubble Space Telescope to obtain distance to, galaxy, to faraway galaxies. A team led by these guys from England used a two-step method to estimate the Hubble constant. Now, hold on just a second. How do you estimate a constant? <laughs> See, there's an equation they use to calculate these distances, and that Hubble constant is one of the multipliers in that equation. But the Hubble constant has to be estimated. Don't you think that will affect the outcome of your equation? That's why they used to say the universe is 20 billion years old. Then they said 18. Now they said 16. Now they're saying 8 to 10. I think they don't know. <laughs> you have to be careful about drawing conclusions because of the Hubble constant, because systematic errors, measurements have huge systematic errors. Well, I agree with that. We simply don't know. And like Hawking said, all you see is a dot of light, folks. You get the biggest telescope, look at the closest star, Alpha Centauri, all you see is a dot. We don't know how big they are. We don't know how far away they are. I think God made all those stars just for the oh wow factor. So we can walk outside and go, oh wow. <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. Amen. Amen. Even the nearest Cephids are so remote that it is difficult to determine their absolute distance with any accuracy, great accuracy. All large distances in astronomical literature are subject to an error of perhaps 10% from this cause alone. And we know that faintness, that's how bright the star is, arises from two causes, distance and absorbing matter in space. It is not generally possible to apportion it accurately between the two. Basically, what they're doing with Cepheid variables is they're looking at a star and saying, that one's pretty bright. Look at another one and say, that ah, is not very bright. It must be farther away. Well, you don't need to be too smart to figure out 
The reason that one's brighter could be because it's closer, or because it is brighter, or because there's no absorbing material in between. Maybe there's a dust cloud between us and the other one. We simply don't know. So don't let somebody tell you, we know the universe is billions of years old because the stars are billions of light years away. We simply don't know that. Okay, the Bible says God sits on the circle of the earth. The Christians have always known the earth is round. And then it said he stretcheth out the heavens. There are several places in the Bible where it says he stretched out the heavens. He stretched them out. It could be that's why we have a red shift, because of the stretching of the heavens. God spoke and stretched everything out. I don't know. But we could have a red shift because of stretching of the heavens, because light is getting tired from traveling great distances, or because of the Doppler effect, or because it is slowed down or being speeded up by going near a black hole or a galaxy. The fact is we simply don't know what's causing this. A fascinating rabbit I like to chase down the trail once in a while. I don't have time tonight, but you might want to get into the study of the original zodiac symbols. Apparently, when God first made the earth, of course, Adam did not have a Bible. So it appears that God may have given Adam the gospel story in the stars. And the whole zodiac constellations up there spelled out the gospel story, how Virgo the virgin would bring forth a son, and he would end up as Leo the lion coming to rule and reign with a rod of iron. And in the middle of all that's Draco the dragon trying to mess everything up. Fascinating story about the gospel and the stars. The Bible talks a lot about the constellations, Pleiades, Orion, all these different constellations. So it could be that the original gospel story was in the stars, and today, of course, it is perverted into the horoscope. But I think the galaxies, uh, the constellations, is, is a lot of fun to study all that. Virgo the Virgin and all these different constellations. However, we're going to do on to some other topics. Why did God use a flood? Why not just destroy all the bad people? Why not just have a miracle? Everybody die. Well, God could do that, but uh, as we mentioned in seminar part six, the flood left evidence. A miracle would not. And the effects of the flood are here to remind us today of what God did. And it gave people a preparation time. They could see this ark going up. Maybe it took them 100 years to build it. Had 100 years to think about it. Man, you better repent. And they still decided not to, uh, not too bright. The Bible says the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. I think the fact that God used a flood showed God's mercy and long-suffering. He wanted to give him another hundred years. He really is a nice guy. Okay, what about carbon dating? We get asked this all the time, one of the questions we get, what about carbon dating? Let me explain how it works. When sunlight or starlight strikes the atmosphere, it produces radioactive carbon, carbon-14. Now, radioactive carbon is unstable, and it begins to break apart. It falls down. They use the word decay. As it decays and falls apart, it has a very predictable half-life. Carbon-14 uh, is radioactive. If you listen to it with a Geiger counter, it'll pick up clicks. You know, click, click, click on your Geiger counter because it is radioactive. That does not mean it listens to the radio a lot. Okay. Carbon-14 breaks down. They've studied it in the laboratory and decided it probably takes about 5,730 years for half of it to decay. Now, I'm going to try to explain carbon dating so the fourth and fifth graders can say, I understand that now because it's not that complicated. This carbon-14 is breaking down or falling apart. Well, the atmosphere we're breathing is mostly nitrogen, 78%, 21% oxygen, 0.06% carbon dioxide and 0.0000765% radioactive carbon. Those radioactive carbon molecules grab onto an oxygen and they become carbon dioxide. Well, plants breathe carbon dioxide. Now, the plant does not care if the carbon dioxide is radioactive or regular carbon dioxide. Either the plant doesn't care or it doesn't know. But the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere gets sucked into these plants. They breathe it. Plants use a process called photosynthesis, and they take carbon dioxide and mix it with water in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll and produce sugar and oxygen. Well, that sugar molecule has some carbon in it, which some of which is radioactive carbon. Because the plant couldn't care less if it's radioactive or not. It's just taking it in, okay? Well, animals come along and eat the plant, so it gets into your body and my body. All of us have a little tiny bit of radioactive carbon in us right now because we ate plants, which, or we ate the animals which ate the plants. Either way, we ended up with it in us. Now, when the plant or animal dies, it stops taking in new carbon-14. So it is assumed 
that the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, the ratio, which is not very much, very tiny fraction, it is assumed that would be the same ratio found in us and found in the plants. And that may be true, I don't know. Nobody knows for sure if that's true, but it could very well be true that it's the same ratio. So the atmosphere contains 0.0000765%. They assume the plants and animals have the same amount. Could be, I don't know, doesn't matter. Plants or animal dies, they stop taking in carbon-14, so whatever they had begins to decay, and it decays, about half of it's gone in 5,730 years. So the theory goes, if you found a fossil in the ground and it had, you know, carbon, like charcoal or something, if you tested how much C14 it had, and it was only half as much as it's supposed to have, you'd say, well, it's been dead for 5,730 years, because half of it has decayed, it's half gone. Now, the way it works, it goes from half to a fourth to an eighth to a sixteenth to a thirty-second to not much, okay? Basically, after five half-lives, you cannot measure the distance, dif difference. So if somebody tells you, we know the universe is billions of years old because of carbon dating, you can rest assured they don't have a clue what they're talking about. <laughs> because even if it worked, carbon dating would only work for thirty or forty thousand years. So when they say, we know it's millions of years old, right away you can write those guys off. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. Okay? It wouldn't work for millions of years. It would only work for a few thousand. It sounds like it would work even for a few thousand, but there are some obvious assumptions that are thrown in here. Let me explain them to you. Assumption number one, they are assuming the amount of C14 in the atmosphere today has always been the same. And we know that's not true. I'll show you that in a minute. If I told you to fill a barrel full of water, but I drilled holes in the side of the barrel. As you're filling the barrel, it's going to start leaking out the holes. You have actually two processes going at the same time, a filling and a leaking process. Eventually, you're going to reach a stage called equilibrium, and you are never going to be able to fill the barrel. Got, follow, follow me so far? It's leaking as fast as you're putting it in. Kind of like your checkbook, right? <laughs> Put it in, it leaks out. Okay. Well. The sunlight is producing carbon-14. That's the filling process. Decay is taking it out. That's the leaking process. It has been determined that the atmosphere would reach equilibrium in about 30,000 years, which means if you took a brand new planet Earth, created it from scratch like the Bible says it was, and stuck it out in the solar system, within 30,000 years it would equalize and you would have a consistent amount of C14. The problem is, Earth's atmosphere has still not reached equilibrium, which proves the Earth is not even 30,000 years old yet. Now, when they first invented carbon dating, they said, hey, Willard Libby, 1950, uh, around that era, for, got a Nobel Prize for it, University of Chicago. He said, well, we know the Earth is millions of years old, so we can forget about the equilibrium problem. Oh, sorry, right there's a mistake. It still has not reached equilibrium, and the Earth is not millions of years old. It's about 6,000 years old. They have a graph, though, that they uh, tell the age of objects with. You get about 16 clicks on your Geiger counter from the atmospheric carbon today. That would be the amount of C14 you would have. If you waited until you only got eight clicks, it would be 5,730 years old. We'll kind of oversimplify this a little bit. If you're only getting four clicks, it would be 11,000 years old. If you're only getting two clicks, it would be 17,000 years old. So if you're getting two and a half clicks, you just figure it out on the graph how old it is. And this is how they do it, with a calibration curve. If you walked into a room <clears throat> and found a candle burning on the table, and I asked the question, when was it lit? You said, I don't know, it was burning when I got here. Okay, well, let's see if we can figure out when the candle was lit. We're going to do what is called empirical science. We're going to measure the height of the candle. We measure it very carefully, and we all decide, we agree, it is seven inches tall. Who can tell me now when it was lit? Well, that won't tell you, will it? We need to get some more science here. Let's measure how fast it burns. We get Olympic stopwatches out there, and we time it precisely. And after arguing for a while and publishing all of our articles in the, in the journals, we decide it is burning one inch per hour. Here's our two facts. It is seven inches tall. It's burning an inch an hour. Who can tell me how long it was burning before we got there? Nobody. 
Well, I'll tell you why. <clears throat> we just ran out of science now, and we're going to have to go to what is called assumptions. Assumption number one, how tall was it? Was it 12 feet tall or 12 miles tall or 12 inches tall? We don't know, do we? Assumption number two, has it always burned at the same rate? We don't know that. So with carbon dating, you dig up a fossil. You can measure how much carbon is in it. And you can measure how fast the carbon decays. And then you have to go to assumptions. How much carbon was in it when it was alive? Has it always decayed at the same rate? We don't know that. If the earth had a canopy of water or ice overhead, like the Bible says it did, that would even further slow down the amount of C14. And if you have a worldwide flood where the earth is totally covered by water, that's going to totally upset the carbon in the atmosphere. It's going to really reset all the clocks from that worldwide flood. So it changed things radically. Suppose before the flood, they only had two clicks per minute and it drowned in the flood, and we dug it up as a fossil and said it's only got one click per minute, we would assume it started at 16 and count it as being, you know, 20,000 years old when it's not. I'll give you some examples of how it doesn't work. Living mollusk shells were carbon dated at 2,300 years old. They were still alive. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated at 27,000 years old. One part of a mammoth was 29,000 years old, another part was 44,000 years old. <laughs> Two parts from the same animal. Baby Dima, the mammoth that was frozen, that was dug up, <clears throat> one part was 40,000 years old, another part was 26,000, and the wood under it and next to it was only 9,000. Which number is going to get published? Two mammoths found in Colorado Creek, I'm sorry, uh, the lower leg of a Fairbanks Creek mammoth had a radiocarbon age of 15,000. The skin was 21,000. Again, two numbers from the same animal. Two mammoths side by side were 22,000 and 16,000 years old. Which number are you going to believe? Living penguins are carbon dated at 8,000 years old. At Berkeley, California, <clears throat> Carl Swisher used the most advanced dating techniques to date hominid fossils, Homo erectus, or Homo sapien, he was going to date. Watch this now. He thought erectus lived 250,000 years ago. So he goes into this dating with a preconceived idea. He's looking for 250,000 years. He kept making the startling find, though. Swisher <clears throat> said the bones were 53,000 years at most and possibly no more than 27,000 years. I would like to point out that that is about a 96% error. And this is the most advanced dating techniques they have. How long would that hold up in a court of law? Well, judge, there's a 96% chance we're wrong here, but we want you to lock this guy up anyway. Here's what we know. If you date a sample of known age, carbon dating doesn't work. If you date a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. <clears throat> What they really do to date fossils is they date them by the layer they're found in in the geologic column. Fossils have been and still are the most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. This guy said, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. They don't date stuff with carbon dating when it comes to fossils. They tell you the age of the fossil by which layer they found it in. That's how it's done. It all comes from the geologic column, which we covered on tape four. The geologic column doesn't exist, except in the textbooks. It's the only place you can find it. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. The rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> Figure that one out. Stratigraphy cannot avoid this kind of reasoning if it insists on using only temporal concepts because circularity is inherent. It's all based on circular reasoning, folks. Get video number four if you missed that. In the last two years, an absolute date was obtained for the Gandong beds above the Trenel beds. It has the very interesting value of 300,000 years plus or minus 300,000 years. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, they nailed that one right down, didn't they? Yep, you can see how old it is. Moon rocks were brought back, given to six different laboratories, and they got six different ages, ranging from 2.5 billion to 4.6 billion. I called uh, J.P. Dawson, James Dawson. There's his phone number and address right there. He's got a website, jpdawson.com. 
He was in charge of dating the moon rocks for NASA. I said, how old are the rocks? He said, we don't know. We got numbers ranging from 10,000 to several billion from the same rock. He said, how, how old would you like it to be? <laughs> Take your pick. This book, uh, Bones of Contention, has a great chapter about the dating game. The last chapter is called The Dating Game, showing how they can change the dates whenever the need arises. For instance, they date a layer of ash using potassium argon dating. When a volcano erupts, it lays down a layer of ash every place. And the theory goes that this should be what is called an event horizon. So if you find a fossil under that layer, it should be older. If you find a fossil above that layer, it should be younger. Sounds good. So they simply dig down through the earth and date the layers of ash. And then any fossils found in between have to be some number in between those two dates. Sounds really good. Has a problem though. For years, they dated a layer of ash, which came to be known as the KBS Tuff. They, they said it was 212 to 230 million years old. That was the accepted age for the KBS Tuff in 1970. 1972, Richard Leakey found a perfectly normal human skull under the KBS Tuff. Well, now wait a minute. They've been teaching the kids for years that humans didn't evolve till a couple million years ago, and this stuff was 200 million years old. So either you've got to say man's been here for 200 million years, which throws out all the evolution they've ever been teaching, or you have to figure out some way to redate the KBS tough. So in, now had they not found that skull, they never would have changed the dates. It was the finding of that skull that made them change the dates on this layer of ash. So they redated the KBS tough. Ten samples were taken, and the dates now range from 0.5 to 2.64 million. That's way down from 200 million, don't you think? I'd like to point out that even that is about a 500% error. <laughs> Again, I would have to say, I think they don't know. In 1770, George Buffon said, the earth is 70,000 years old. In 1905, the official age of the earth was 2 billion. Hmm, what happened in those 200 years? By the way, uh, Students today are told it is 4.6 billion. It appears to me that the earth is getting older at the rate of about 21 million years per year. <laughs> That's about 40 years per minute. <laughs> Aging rapidly, folks. Here's the things to consider about carbon dating. Wild dates are frequently obtained. Dates that don't fit the geologic column are rejected. So why date it anyway? If you already know how, it is from the ge how old it is from the geologic column, why carbon date it? You're wasting your time. The original age of the content is assumed to be consistent. Or the, the original amount in the object, you don't know how much was in the object when it was alive. And the decay rate never changes. That's an assumption that's unprovable. The sample has not been contaminated. I would like to point out, by the way, that all decays that we see, potassium to argon, uranium to lead, carbon-14 decay, all of them are negative. They're backwards, they're downhill. That's the opposite of what evolution needs. They need to find some way to go uphill, and they don't have those ways. Okay, another question was asked. Have fresh dinosaur bones been found? Yes, they have. The book, The Great, Di uh, Great Alaskan Dinosaur Adventure, on uh, page 87, you can read the whole book. It's a tremendous book. Buddy Davis and some other guys wrote it. Uh, they went up to Alaska, and sure enough, found fresh dinosaur bones, unfossilized. They dug several feet through coal and shale to find frozen bones. Some were petrified, others were lightweight, showing little petrification. Uh, Journal of Science, December 1993, reported finding a young duckbill dinosaur. The fine structure of the bones was seen to have been preserved to such an extent the cell characteristics could, could, could be compared with cells of the chicken bone. Very finely preserved. In northwest Alaska, 1961, a geologist found a bed of dinosaur bones unpermineralized. That's a tank tangler. They weren't fossilized. A young Inuit, Eskimo, found a uh, lowered jaw of a duckbill dinosaur. It was in fresh condition, not fossilized. So what about potassium argon dating? Well, it has the same problems. It just has bigger numbers, that's all. The half-life of potassium-40 is supposed to be 1.3 billion years old. They dated some basalt from Mount Etna in Sicily. They knew it erupted in 
122 BC, but the potassium argon age for this lava was 250,000 years old. Now they rejected the date because they knew it was wrong. Oh, well, what about the ones you don't know how old they are? How are you going to know if that date's right? Lava from Hawaiian volcano, 1801, was potassium argon dated at 1.64 million years old. Hmm. Basalt from Mount Kilauea, Kilauea, whatever, <clears throat> icky. It erupted in 1959, <clears throat> gave a potassium argon age of 8.5 million years old. Basalt from Italy, dated at 700,000 when it was only 30 years old. Another volcano in 1972 in Sicily gave a potassium argon age of 350,000 years old. You have the same problems with potassium argon dating as you do with any other dating method. It just doesn't work. What we need is an eyewitness like we have in the Bible. God said this is how he did it, this is when he did it, and we ought to just read it and believe it for what he says. Same problems with potassium argon as any other dating method. Okay, if there was a flood, where are all the human bones? Good question. This pre-flood world was destroyed. Shouldn't we find evidence of this civilization? People say, well, if there was a flood, why don't we dig up their houses? A good question. Let me ask you a question. If we had a perfect world, perfect weather, you wouldn't need a house, would you? If the animals were all vegetarian like the Bible says they were, you wouldn't need to be protected from the animals. You wouldn't need a highway to go anyplace because everything's growing in your yard. You wouldn't need a store. What would you need anyway? What would you expect to find from a perfect world? Think about that. I think the problems with this finding a human skeletons, Robert, or, uh, Marvin Lubinow says about 4,000 human remains have been found. <clears throat> I don't know if he's right or not, but let's assume that's a reasonable number. Most of those are very fragmentary. Very few complete human skeletons have been found. If God created the world, 6,000 years ago, it was full of animals and full of plants and only two people. When the flood came 1,600 years later, it was still full of plants and still full of animals, but still not full of people, which means there weren't as many people to drown as there were animals, so the probability of finding people is much less in fossilized than the probability of finding animals fossilized because there weren't as many. The population simply had not grown as much. The purpose of the flood was to destroy man, the Bible says, so God destroyed him. The Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. So let's just suppose, for the sake of argument, that people before the flood were 10 feet tall. Just suppose, okay? Modern man has got it in his head that ancient man was itty-bitty and tiny, like a chimpanzee. So when he looks for fossils in the ground, he's looking for little tiny bones, isn't he? What if he found a giant one? It would never dawn on him this might be a human because of his preconceived evolutionary assumption. So, giant human bones are found, by the way. We cover a whole lot of that on videotape number two of our series about the giant humans that have been found. Tremendous size. So I think maybe there's a, a misunderstanding of what these bones are. If they only find a fragment of a bone that's it, huge, it might be classified as something else instead of a human when it really should have been a human, a big one. So number one, the reason we find fewer human skeletons is because there were less humans to be killed than there were animals. Number two, people are smarter than animals. Well, some people. Uh, <clears throat> so they would tend to not be buried. They would end up on top, which in, in which case they would rot. Uh, how many buffalo were slaughtered out west over the last few hundred years? Millions, right? Go find me one fossilized buffalo. You won't find any because they weren't buried. They laid on top, and so they rotted. The bones and all rotted. So probably the humans were less likely to fossilize because they're smarter and would avoid drowning till the last minute. Number three, if the humans were bigger, they wouldn't be recognized as human, just simply because they're bigger. So that's the answer to that question. Take a few more here. Where did Noah get pitch? Isn't it from post-flood oil? If you watch my debate number seven, I debated a former preacher turned atheist from Church of Christ Preacher. One of his big arguments was, the Bible says God told Noah to cover the ark with pitch, and yet pitch is made from oil. Genesis chapter 6, God said you will pitch it within and without. He said you can't get pitch because you creationists are saying the oil formed because of the flood, and how did Noah get pitch? 
Well, the guy had a basic misunderstanding <clears throat> of where pitch comes from. The Bible talks about pitch in the book of Exodus. Uh, Moses' ark was pitched. Isaiah talks about a land of burning pitch. The smoke thereof goes up. Hmm. If you get a dictionary from 19, or 1828, Webster's Dictionary, look up the word pitch. Pitch, a thick, tenacious substance, the juice of a species of pine or fir, called whatever that is in Latin. <clears throat> See, Latin is a dead language. It killed the Romans, and now it's killing us. <clears throat> it's obtained by abscission from the bark of the tree. For years, people made pitch. There were whole industries. All they did was produce pitch to be able to cover ships. They were, before oil was even drilled in America, there were pitch factories making pitch just for the ship industry. Webster's Dictionary, 1828. The resin of pine or turpentine. It's used in caulking ships and paying the sides and bottom. So Noah knew about pitch. Don't tell me it's from oil. The guy simply didn't know what he was talking about. Okay, next question. Was ancient man primitive? Don't they try to get across the idea in school that modern man is smart and ancient man is dumb? Well, let's see the facts about this. There's a great book called uh, The Puzzle of Ancient Man. You can call our ministry and get a copy of that. The Puzzle of Ancient Man. Great book by Don Chittick. This a little airplane was found in a grave in Columbia, South America. It's now in the Smithsonian. It's about a thousand years old. The Smithsonian has it labeled as a stylized insect. Uh, would you call that a stylized insect? I don't think so. Amazing, what we would call advanced artifacts are found in graves from time to time. This uh, iron pot was found inside a lump of coal. They broke open the coal, there was the pot inside. Carl Baugh now has it in his museum in Texas. There are stones in Peru that weigh 20,000 tons. Cut stones fit together. The biggest crane on earth today can lift 3,000 tons. How did they lift and move a 20,000 ton stone? I don't think ancient man was primitive. If you stop and think about it, most of the things we use today for source of energy, power, comes from burning fossil fuels like gasoline or oil, or from the movement of an electron like electricity, okay? Maybe they knew about other sources that we don't even consider. We don't use the magnetic field of the earth for a power source, do we? What if they knew how to harness the magnetic field? What if they knew how to harness a gravitational field? What if there are other energy sources we've never thought of before that they knew about? You see, you've got to understand, when God made Adam, Adam came pre-programmed from the hand of this Creator. He used 100% of his brain. Einstein said he thought people today use less than 10%. I had students when I taught that used much less than that. <laughs> Adam not only came pre-programmed, he lived 900 years. How much could you learn in 900 years? No, I don't think ancient man was primitive at all. This bronze uh, bell was found inside a lump of coal. Newt Anderson has it. He, he's the one that found it. Just call him up. He's got it sitting on his desk right now. There's his phone number and email. This thing was found in rocks, supposed to be 600 million years old. Inlaid vessels. They knew how to do all sorts of things. A ship that sank in 100 B.C. was taken up, and they found a calculator inside. Analog calculator from 2,000 years ago. Explain that one, would you please? It's now in the National Science Foundation. We somehow got the wrong idea. Now, what we have today is more technology. Technology is not to be equated with intelligence. Amen. The reason we can have a calculator watch that holds 300 phone numbers is because somebody a long time ago figured out how to make a diode. Somebody else figured out how to make a transistor. Somebody else figured out how to make a resistor. Somebody else discovered electrical movements. I mean, there's a whole lot of inventions that went into this watch. The guy who built the watch only accumulated all that knowledge. He didn't think up all of it. It doesn't mean he's any smarter than the rest. He just used an accumulation of knowledge that somebody else did. That's all. So man's not any smarter. This hammer, Carl Ball has the original in his museum in Texas, 96% iron, 2.6% chlorine. It's a stainless steel with no carbon. 
They were very advanced in their metallurgy before the flood. What appears to be a battery was found in rock supposed to be 2,000 years old. One of the Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics in the, one of the uh, graves showed mummies hooked up to an electrical source. They had electricity over 3,000 years ago. No, ancient man was not primitive. Okay, next question. What about the Great Pyramid? Who built the Great Pyramid? What was it built for anyway? Now, there are 67 pyramids in Egypt. That's my understanding. Only one of them is called the Great Pyramid. Some people call it the Pyramid of Cheops or Cheops. The others are obviously copies of this Great Pyramid. But the original pyramid is pretty interesting. The Bible says in Isaiah that the, God's going to make an altar and a pillar at the border thereof. This will be an altar in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof. The story is told that Egypt used to be two feuding kingdoms, and right on the border between the northern and southern kingdom is where the Great Pyramid is. Then when Egypt became one kingdom, that pyramid now became the middle of the kingdom. So it is both at the border and in the middle. Interesting. Side thought. The Great Pyramid is uh, absolutely an amazing structure. It's by far the largest structure ever built on earth. It is 90 times bigger than the Sears Tower in volume. 90 times larger. Napoleon said there's enough stone in the Great Pyramid to build a 10-foot high brick wall completely around France, which is roughly the size of Texas. It's a pretty big pyramid. Inside the Great Pyramid, there are some amazing uh, passageways. It, it could be, and I don't know, I wouldn't be dogmatic on this, but it could be, it could be, God gave Adam and Eve the gospel story in the stars. Noah was given the gospel story, or somebody around this time frame, maybe before the flood or maybe after. The pyramid was built by somebody around this time frame. Some people think Adam built it. Some people think Enoch built it. Some people think Noah built it after the flood. It could be that it was built before the flood and was the only structure to survive the flood. I don't know, okay? But it certainly does have some interesting parallels that may be the gospel story in stone. For instance, if you walk in the doorway, you can go down the broad way that leads down to the pit, or you can choose the narrow way that goes up to the king's chamber. I read about that someplace in the Bible. If you choose the narrow way, you go up 153 steps. 153. That number is mentioned in the Bible one time. They cast the net into the sea and drew in 153 great fishes. Maybe uh, there's going to be gathered of all nations into the kingdom of God. Maybe that represents the gathering of all the nations, 153. I don't know, just an interesting thought. When you do get up to the king's chamber, you find yourself in an empty uh, tomb with a red granite tomb, which has, I understand, the same volume as the Ark of the Covenant. The sides of the Great Pyramid were covered, it was covered with 144,000 smooth, polished casing stones. 144,000. I read about that in the Bible someplace. And it's not the Jehovah's Witness either, by the way. <laughs> I don't think any of them are going, let alone 144,000 of them. Uh, but inside this tomb, I understand it has the same dimensions as the Ark of the Covenant, or at least the same volume. The top of the pyramid was never finished. The chief cornerstone was never put in place. Largest building in the world, one stone short of being finished. A cornerstone on a pyramid is interesting. It has five sides. Five is the number of grace. Building never finished. The Bible talks about Jesus Christ as being the chief cornerstone, the head of the corner, right? Mark chapter 12 says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. The stone which the builders rejected. It's mentioned all through the Bible. In the book of Daniel, it talks about the stone cut out of the mountain that smote the image on the feet. It just could be that the Great Pyramid is symbolic of God's kingdom, and the cornerstone is Jesus Christ. And he hasn't finished the job yet. Now, the Luciferians have tried to put the, uh, on the back of our dollar bill, they have the little pyramid with the all-seeing eye on top. They think they're, you know, Lucifer's going to come down and finish the job. That all-seeing eye represents Lucifer. You have to watch video number five for more on that. But uh, it's not representing God, by the way. And they think they're going to finish the job. Uh, New Year's Eve, 1999, when it turned over the year 2000, um, Bush and Margaret Thatcher and some others were planning a big ceremony to go in the Great Pyramid and install the cornerstone. Big symbolic deal. How many remember that? 
New Year's Eve, uh, they, they called it the millennium, it wasn't the millennium change, but they were going to install the pyramid, the uh, cornerstone. It's always been a symbol for the New Agers as their goal to get a one world government, to gather everybody together and put Lucifer in charge. Christians have been teaching for years that the New Jerusalem is 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, and they always say it's a big cube. Well, now slow down. It doesn't say it's a big cube. It says it's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. It could be a big pyramid. In which case, there's only one building that has one cornerstone. Pyramid. All square buildings have four cornerstones, don't they? Pyramid has one. And if it's pure gold, which is translucent, and He's the light thereof, it'll shine right through the whole thing. Just something to think about. Okay. But this uh, pyramid on the back of your dollar bill is representative of uh, Lucifer's kingdom, not God's kingdom. Okay. Was the, earth, or was the earth ever a hot molten mass? How many of you kids were taught in school that the earth cooled down from a hot molten mass billions of years ago? Did you know there's some amazing scientific evidence that that simply is not true? This textbook says, As earth formed, its surface was like the moon. It was hot, and there were large pools of bubbling lava. Well, I'm sorry, this is simply not true. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, the earth was created under water, which means it was not a hot molten mass. So somebody is wrong, okay? Either the Bible's wrong or the textbook is wrong. I think I know who it is. <laughs> Robert Gentry has an amazing uh, website, halos.com. You might want to check that out. Robert Gentry did studies on granite rock, and he discovered granite from all over the world contains these little polonium halos. The strange thing about polonium halos is, when polonium decays, it has a very, very short half-life. Some of it's up to three minutes, some of it's down to 1.164 seconds. Very short half-life. So a polonium halo is sort of like a hand grenade going off underwater. It's going to make a ring, and then it's going to dissolve. If you exploded a hand grenade underwater, or like you watch the 4th of July fireworks, the rocket goes up, <laughs> makes, a little, makes a circle in the air, but it doesn't last, does it? It falls apart. Suppose you made a circle in the air from an explosion, <clears throat> and then you completely froze the atmosphere to hold the sphere in place. You'd have to freeze it really fast, wouldn't you? And of course you can't do that that fast. Halos in the rock exist because it was never a hot molten mass. Because if the rock was liquid, the halo would disappear. Robert Gentry's work got published in all the major science journals until somebody realized, wow, this proves the Big Bang Theory is wrong. <laughs> and they shut him off like a spigot. They wouldn't publish any of his stuff anymore. Nothing wrong with it scientifically, but it just goes against the theory. See, evolution is a very carefully protected state religion. Very carefully protected. If I want to get a hold of Robert Gentry's book, he's in Knoxville, Tennessee area. Um, halos.com. His son uh, is doing great work continuing their ministry. They both travel and speak on their research with halos, proving the Bible is absolutely right. Okay? A few more questions before the break. What about global warming? How many have ever heard of global warming before? Is there an ozone problem? Well, there is a large ozone hole over Washington, D.C. <laughs> it's because of all the caustic hot air that rises off of that city. But, uh, I would, I would steer you to the book, Facts Not Fear. You can get it from Derry Brownfield. Have you ever heard of Derry Brownfield show? He's in Missouri here. Centerfield, Missouri. Center something, Missouri. Centerville, population six, I believe. Uh, great book, though, that you can get called Facts Not Fear. There isn't an ozone problem. There isn't an environmental problem. The real purpose behind the environmental movement is Karl Marx's communist plank number one, abolish private property. That's the purpose. The purpose is not to save the environment. The purpose is to abolish private property. See, they want you to have to get a permit to cut down a tree on your own property. You know, these environmentalists, they, they, they drive me nuts. They'll say, trees have rights. I say, yeah, I think oxygen molecules have rights too, and you ought to quit breathing. <laughs> hmm? Water molecules have rights. What gives you the right to drink that thing, huh? Quit drinking water. No, God gave us dominion over the earth. We're not to abuse it, but we're to control it. And it's perfectly fine to cut down a tree. All right. 
Doesn't the Green River Formation prove the Earth is millions of years old? I do debates, and atheists almost always bring this one up. What happened in Wyoming, there's a formation of rocks, which is thousands and thousands of real thin layers called the Green River Formation. And they're going to say that each of these layers represents a seasonal change because there's two different kinds of pollen, summer in, or springtime and fall or something like that. And they're going to say, see, this proves it has took millions of years to get all this because each one is a different season. Well, the problem with this is there are several problems with this. They took Green River Formation rock, ground it back to powder, poured it into moving water, and it resorted it into thousands of layers. You ever seen those things you buy at the store with two pieces of glass and the sand in between? When you flip it over, it automatically sorts it into hundreds of layers, doesn't it? You can get a pile of salt and pepper, stir it up, pour it out on the table, just pour it on the table, and then very carefully slice through your pile, and you'll find it is layered, stratified. Hmm. The flood formed the Green River Formation. As they dig down through the Green River Formation, they find layers of ash from volcanoes, an event horizon. The problem is, between the event horizons, there's as much as a 35% difference in the number of layers between the same two event horizons. Those are not representative of different years. I'm sorry, it's not millions of years old. One last question before the break. What about the Mars rock? How many heard about them finding life on Mars, you know, or finding the <laughs> Mars rock with life on it? Let me tell you the real story about the Mars rock, okay? Here's a picture of the Mars rock. This rock was found in Antarctica. It was not brought back from Mars. Most of the stuff we sent up to Mars, we can't even talk to it anymore. <laughs> right? <laughs> Are you still up there? <laughs> Anybody home? Uh, they found this little wiggly line on this Mars rock. There's the wiggly line right there. That is the proof of life on Mars. That's it. They got all excited about this. The timing of this was very interesting. The rock had been found years earlier and was sitting in a laboratory for many years. NASA was having trouble getting their funding through Congress. The NASA grant money was stalled in Congress. They had to find something important to make everybody realize we need to keep spending all these billions of dollars on NASA so they can keep sending up rockets to keep putting up spy satellites to spy on us during the New World Order, which is the real purpose of all this stuff. And uh, they, they wanted to get their funding through Congress, but they had to find something important, so they resurrected this rock out of the laboratory and said, wow, look at this, a wiggly line, proof, life on Mars, where's our money, please? And it worked great, okay? I'd like to point out that the distance between Earth and Mars is, is fairly great. The closest they ever get would be like having, if you shrank Earth and Mars down to the size of a tomato, Earth would be a four inch tomato, Mars would be a two inch tomato. It's about half the diameter of the Earth. The closest they ever get in their orbits is a third of a mile away at that scale. If I told you, I want you to shoot that two inch tomato a third of a mile away, I want you to shoot it so that a piece of it splatters onto this tomato over here, but you can't leave a dent on that one. <laughs> Don't you think that's just a little far-fetched? You found a rock at the South Pole. How do you know it came from Mars? Okay, some things to consider about this. Um, they just discovered here recently, 1997, that is actually was not a fossil on Mars. It's part of a normal chemical reaction. That was discovered shortly after the grant money was released <laughs> and spent, I'm sure. Um, things to consider. They claim it came from Mars. They claim it broke off 16 million years ago and landed 13,000 years ago. How do they know all of this? Okay. What did this bacteria eat for 16 million years? Hmm? How did it survive the impact, the vacuum of space, the entry, the freezing for 13,000 years? NASA offended team did the research. Now that's interesting. Talk about the fox watching the hen house. NASA grant money was stalled in Congress. When the announcement was made, the money was soon released. My Bible says, Eve is the mother of all living. I don't think there's any life in any other planets. I think it's all right here. What about theistic evolution? I get asked this question all the time. Couldn't God have used evolution to create the world? Well, yeah, he could have, but he doesn't need to. 
and he didn't. The Bible's real clear that God made everything in six days, and the Bible says the worlds were framed by the Word of God. God spoke it into existence, okay? There's no reason for theistic evolution. It's not even a reasonable theory. The Bible says in six days, God made everything, and on the seventh day, He rested. I mean, that's the clear, obvious teaching of the Bible. The works were finished from the foundation of the world, according to Hebrews chapter 3, or chapter 4, and it says, God rest the seventh day. So it was obviously a six-day creation with one day of rest. Genesis chapter 2 says the seventh day God ended His work which He made from all His work. The Bible teaches in Romans chapter 5 death came by sin and 1 Corinthians 15 says basically the same thing, by man came death. Now if the theistic evolution theory is true, then you already had death here before man even arrived on the scene. So the theistic evolution position is unscriptural. You can claim to believe God used evolution if you want, but don't also claim to believe the Bible because you don't. Amen. Okay? You'd have to twist an awful lot of scriptures to make God use evolution to get us here. The Bible says God told Adam to replenish the earth, and some folks say this makes proof for a gap in there, you know, and it's simply not true. We cover that on videotape number two. Genesis 1.26 says God made man in his own image. So is the image of God an amoeba? or an ape, or, you know, what is the image of God anyway? Uh, some problems with theistic evolution. Number one, it's not the clear teaching of the Bible. That's pretty obvious. If you gave the Bible to 5,000 people who knew nothing about the arguments and said, read this and tell me what it says, none of them would, out of 5,000 would come up with theistic evolution. They would all come back and say, well, it says God did it in six days. Now, the God that I worship is capable of writing a book that the average person can read and understand most of it. And I get real nervous about most of these theistic evolutionist gurus want you to believe you have to have them to interpret that book for you. They're really building their own little kingdom. My God wrote a book that I can read and understand and I don't need anybody else to tell me what it says. And you don't either. Read it and do what it says. Now there are some things in the Bible I don't understand. Okay? And that bothers me a little bit. But what bothers me more is the things I do understand. <clears throat> <laughs> That's what's really bothering me. The second thing I'd like to point out, it would be a retarded God that have to use evolution to get the world to be here. Can't your God make it right first time? I mean, what's the problem? Is he, you know, something wrong with him? The God that I worship made it right first time. Now, man messed it up, but God made it right. He didn't have to use evolution. Theistic evolutionists have a very limited God. It is not the God of the Bible, and it's not a God worth worshiping. It is a pretty nice God, though, because then you can stick him into a closet someplace and go off and live your life by yourself. That's the reason people like that theistic evolution theory. They don't like a God that says, these are the commandments. Amen. They want a God that says, these are my suggestions. No, they're called Ten Commandments. <laughs> Thou shalt not, all right? Um, it's not in the character of God to use suffering and misfits and death to accomplish his goals. And that's what theistic evolutionists has to believe. That's just not the way my God did it. It nullifies the need for the death of Christ. See, man brought death into the world. Adam was the first man, and Christ is the second Adam, and it's his death on the cross that pays for our sins. Amen. No, folks, it, it's, theistic evolution is a ridiculous theory. There's no evidence for evolution anyway. So why would we compromise a perfectly good Bible with a dumb theory like that? <laughs> just doesn't fit. <laughs> 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 Wolf in sheep's clothing. That's my opinion of the, those who teach theistic evolution. Uh, <clears throat> I get asked the question very frequently, why do you use the King James Bible? Now, we can go off on a 10-hour uh, rabbit trail here if you'd like, but I won't do that tonight. To give you just a quick history of how we got our Bible, when the Bible was first being written, at least the New Testament in, uh, in Greek, they didn't have a printing press, didn't have a Xerox machine. When you wanted to make a copy, you had to write out a copy. And so uh, it was a long, tedious process of writing out these copies to the Bible. And if, you, if they found a mistake in it, well, they'd burn it. Well, you didn't want to work for three months writing out a copy and have it get burned because you're not going to get paid for your three months' work. So they had a very neat system of checking the copies to make sure they're accurate. So they would check all the copies by counting the letters, count the words, read it backwards, et cetera, et cetera. 
Once they had a certified copy, they would uh, mark it as a certified copy, and that's accepted as exactly like the original. Well, you can only roll and unroll a scroll so many times, and it starts to wear out. After a few hundred years of copying off the original, the original is worn out. And so you throw it away. You don't need it anymore because you now have 50 copies of the original. So then you take those copies and you use those for a few hundred years and they get worn out and then you can throw those away because you now have 500 copies of the originals. About the first few hundred years after Christ, there was a cult that came up on the scene, sort of like Jehovah's Witness. You know, they wanted to claim to be Christians, but they wanted to have their own Bible say what they thought it should say. So they made their own manuscript of the Bible. It came to be known as the Alexandrian Manuscript because it was made in Alexandria, Egypt, which at that time was a major uh, learning center of the world. They changed all sorts of things in this Alexandrian Manuscript. It was a counterfeit Bible. Now, it was a close counterfeit because if you're going to make a counterfeit $20 bill, you don't put Mickey Mouse's picture on there. <laughs> right? You want it close enough for people will accept it. It was a close counterfeit, but they changed an awful lot of things. They didn't like the idea of the deity of Christ. So very frequently when it said, Lord Jesus Christ, they just said Jesus. Hmm. Well, this Alexandrian manuscript was not used. The early church recognized it as a fraud and said, forget it, so they never used it. Meanwhile, the originals are getting used and worn out and used and worn out. You come to the early 1500s and they get the Wycliffe Bible, the Tyndale Bible, the Great Bible, the She Bible, and all that kind of stuff, you know, all these Bibles being translated into English and the King James Bible. And everybody's happy because they now have 5,000 copies of this, what's called the Texas Receptus, the received text. They compared all the copies and found out little minor changes, usually spelling changes, you know, Peter and Pedro, you know, cities change names and stuff like that. Basically spelling changes. Everything else is fine. No major doctrines were affected by these little minor errors between these 5,000 copies. So everybody's happy. But the oldest manuscript they had at the time was about 800 years old. Somebody comes along a few hundred years later and finds the Alexandrian manuscript and says, wow, this is older, therefore it's better. And right there's the mistake. Yes, it's older, but it's older because it's worse. It wasn't used. And so in the last few hundred years, we've had all sorts of translations made of the Alexandrian manuscript. So they are good translations by smart men with sincere motives, I assume, but they're translating a lousy manuscript. It's like somebody doing a good translation of Playboy. Well, <laughs> yay, I'm glad you're a good translator, but you, you know, it's still a lousy magazine, okay? <laughs> And so most of the newer study Bibles that we have today or newer, newer versions of the Bible are at least based on or incorporated into them the Alexandrian manuscript. I stick with the King James because I, I don't know of a better one. It's not to say God couldn't do it again. You know, he couldn't have, somebody could do it today. For one thing, King James had plenty of money. One of the guys, the guy in charge of the translation committee spoke 45 languages. I think somebody said the average of all the people on the committee that were translating, the average of them spoke 11 languages. These were smart people. This was the days before TV. <laughs> and I don't think anybody's got the money today or the inclination to put together a translation like that again. Even though there's a few words that are hard to understand, you know, I understand all that. I, I guess I would rather try to raise my intellect to the Bible than lower the Bible to my intellect. Amen. It's kind of a general rule of thumb. Now. <clears throat> there are many good Christians that use other versions of the Bible. I got saved. Somebody led me to the Lord out of a reviled substandard perversion that I got in the Methodist church. Okay? There's enough gospel in there to get saved. Okay? You can lead a Jehovah's Witness to the Lord out of his own Bible. There's enough gospel left. They've watered down most of it, but there's enough left in there. You can get them saved. Okay? So I'd rather have somebody reading... NIV than Playboy, if you're going to compare it like that, okay? And I don't think we ought to spend a lot of time fighting younger Christians or Christians who don't know enough to, about the issue, you know, and uh, it's, it's like a whole shock to their system, like, wow, what's wrong with my Bible, you know? Just let them grow into that a little bit, okay? Christians, some of the King James only folks need to have a little more grace uh, 
with those that haven't grown to that point yet, okay? But if you really study the issue, I think you'll find you ought to take the rest of them and put them on the shelf and put a little skull and crossbones on the front of them Amen. and stick with your King James Bible. Amen. I really get nervous when somebody has a satanic logo on the front of their Bible, like the new King James does. A satanic symbol right on the front of their Bible. And I really get nervous when Murdoch is the owner of the copyright of some of these newer Bibles. I mean, something's... First place, I get nervous when a Bible's copyrighted at all. I mean, what's, what's going on here anyway? Uh, you better get the website, uh, avpublications.com, and you can compare all the different versions, okay? I don't want to waste a lot of time on that, but I do kick that rabbit as I walk by, or kick that dog as I walk by. Um, <laughs> Uh, avpublications.com. Okay, question. Are there contradictions in the Bible? I was raised in the Lutheran Church, the Mennonite Church, and the Methodist Church. Then I got saved, started going to a little right-wing, radical, temperamental, independent, fundamental Baptist Church in Pekin, Illinois. My parents got worried because I was getting a little bit, you know, <clears throat> excited about living for God. And I was going to church three or four times a week and reading my Bible an hour a day, and I really turned over. I didn't turn over a new leaf. I, I planted a whole new tree, okay? <laughs> It was a whole new Kent Hovind at its age 16. And my parents were excited for that, but they thought, you know, we need to calm him down a little bit. So they said, son, we'd like you to go to the Methodist church camp. <clears throat> Maybe they can calm you down a little bit. And this particular church I went to was extremely liberal. I went back and asked the preacher after I got saved. I said, preacher, are you going to heaven? He said, I don't believe there is a heaven. <laughs> this is my former preacher. <clears throat> anyway, I went to this church camp. I was, I'd only been saved a couple of months, okay? Here I was, 16 years old, at the camp, first night at the camp. The counselor sets us down on the, all the bunks, and he says, Fellas, I want you to know I'm a student at the University of Illinois, and I'm a humanist. This is my counselor for the week. I did not know what a humanist was, so I said, Does that mean you believe in humans? <laughs> he said, Well, yes, I believe in humans, but then, no, that's not what that means. I said, Well, do you believe the Bible? He said, No. He said, The Bible is a good book, but... Uh, I don't believe the Bible because the Bible has contradictions in it. Now, I'd only been saved a couple of months, but I, I, my preacher taught me, if somebody says that to you, hand them your Bible and say, show me one. So I stuck out my chest, handed him my Bible and said, show me one. He said, I'll be glad to. Here's what he showed me. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 12. The Bible says God, gave the grass, God made the grass, the plants, and the trees on the third day. The counselor said, Kent, when did God make the trees and grass? I said, day three. He said, very good. Now look at verse number 20. On day five, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature and the fowl that hath life. He said, Kent, when did God make the birds? I said, he made them on day five. He said, what did he make them out of? I said, he made them out of the water. He said, that's right. Now let's keep going. Look at verse number 24. On day six, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. And then on verse 26, he said, let us make man. He said, now Kent, let's get this straight. Chapter one has the plants made on day three, the birds made out of the water on day five, animals made out of the dirt, and man made after the animals. Do you agree? I said, yep, I agree. He said, good. Now look at chapter two, verse number seven. Day six, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree. He said, now hold on just a minute, Kent. I thought chapter one had the trees made before man. Now chapter two has the trees made after man. See, the Bible has a contradiction. He said it gets worse. In chapter two, in verse 19, it says God made the birds out of the ground after man was made. On day six. Chapter one has the birds made out of the water before man on day five. Chapter two, verse 19, has the animals made after man, and chapter one has the animals made before man. He said, Kent, the Bible is a good book, but it is full of contradictions. Now, I normally start off my seminar by saying, I believe the Bible is the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of the living God. Amen. So if that's true, what about this contradiction in Genesis chapter one? This comes up a lot. Almost every debate I do, some professor will bring this up. He'll say, which creation account do you believe, the first one or the second one? I say, oh, I believe them both. 
He said, but they're contradictory. I said, no, they're not either. Here's what happened. In chapter 2, verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. By the way, fellas, it is two words. Help meet. Not a help meet. See, a help that is meet. The word meet is an old English word that means suitable. He made a helper that is suitable. Big difference there. He made a help that was meet for him. God said, I will make a help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air to see what Adam would call them. Here's the sequence. On day three, God made the plants. On day five, He made the birds out of the water. On day six, He made the man. And then, I'm sorry, He made the animals. And then He made man. And then He made a garden. And then He put the trees in the garden only. Adam watched them grow. So the trees that are made in the garden is not referring to the rest of the world, which is full of trees. It's only referring to the trees in the garden. Then he made one more of each animal so that Adam could name them and select a wife. So Adam stood there, and up out of the ground came a hippopotamus, and he said, Hippo, no thanks. <laughs> up. Amen. Up, uh, up came a giraffe. He said, uh, Giraffe, no thanks. And one by one, God made one of each of the animals. The rest of the world's already full of animals. He's just making one more, folks. See, I think the reason God did this, if God had made Adam last, Satan could come in and say, I did this. How would Adam know? Right. There is only one person who did not get to see God create anything. Eve, right? Who did Satan trick? Amen. Eve. See, Satan couldn't fool Adam. Adam knew God made these things. He watched it happen. So the, what's happening here, chapter 2 is an expansion of the events on day 6. It's not a contradiction. Amen. There are no contradictions in the Bible. Amen. He's just expanding it. I remember as a new Christian, I was studying math and science, which I taught for 15 years, and I came across 2 Chronicles chapter 4. And it says Solomon made this big, huge brass bowl, a brazen laver, Molten sea, it was 10 cubits from brim to brim, and a line of 30 cubits did compass it about. I set my Bible on my bed and I said, God, this is a mistake. At the time, I was being persecuted for my faith as a Christian at East Peoria High School. You know, you get kids who hate you because you're a Christian and they spit on you and, you know, do bad things to your car and all kinds of things. And I said, Lord, I don't mind taking all this persecution and living for you if your book is right. But if that book's got a mistake in it, I quit. I just, I'm, I'm quitting. It bothered me. Because you see, when you calculate the circumference of a circle, it's the diameter times pi, which is the Greek number 3.1415926.5. It goes on forever and ever. Some Japanese guy figured it out to 700 decimal places. First question I had was, why? <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> The, the circumference of that brass bowl should have been 3.14 cubits, not 30 cu or 31 cubits, not 30 cubits. I thought it was a mathematical stake, mistake in the Bible. So I read the story over and over, and it just bothered me. I said, God, there's a mistake here. He made this big brass bowl 10 cubits across, 30 cubits around, and it says the thickness was in hand breadth. That's a lot of brass, by the way, that thick, solid brass. Now, a cubit is elbow to fingertip. I read it, and I read it, and I read it. Finally, it jumped off the page at me. Wait a minute. It's a hand breadth thick. I bet they measured the outside of the bowl, 10 cubits, because that's the number you would need to get it through a doorway or something. And they measured the inside of the bowl, because that's the number you need to find the volume. So I wondered what the ratio was between hand breadth and cubit. So for quite a while, I went around bothering folks. I said, excuse me, could I measure your cubit? They look at you real funny. I said, put your elbow on the table. So they put their elbow. I would measure their cubit. I would found a ratio, kind of an average, of people's cubit to hand breadth. I found out that if you subtract two hand breadths from 10 cubits and calculate backwards, you will get a value of pi of about 3.1415926.5. See, the Bible is right after all. There are no conflicts in the Bible, no contradictions. This one bothered me too. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 4, Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. 
Memorize that number. 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. When you read the same story told in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, it says, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. Now hold on a minute. Did he have 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots, or did he have 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots? Is there a contradiction in the Bible? Many reference Bibles, including Henry Morris's Defender's Bible, and Henry Morris is a friend of mine, and he's a brilliant man, he's a godly man, but he's got some mistakes in his footnotes, okay? I recommend the Bible, we sell the Bible, and I think you ought to get it. It's one of the best study Bibles I've ever seen. However, he's fallen into the trap of saying that there are, might be copyist errors. No, this is not a copyist error. Amen. All you need to do is read it very carefully. Now, let's watch this carefully now. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. Does it say he had 40,000 chariots? No. He had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots, right? The next verse says he had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. You see the difference? He had 4,000 chariots and 10 horses per chariot. If you look at uh, first, 2 Samuel chapter 10, it says, The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots. If you compare that in 1 Chronicles, it says, The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men, which fought in chariots. They had 10 men and 10 horses per chariot. See, the chariot was like the tank of the day, and you had to have extra horses and extra men in case you got a flat tire. This is a war going on, you know. Somebody's going to get shot, and so they didn't want the chariot left out there because they get a flat tire, so they had extra horses and extra men. Just like tanks will train extra drivers and stuff like that. There are no contradictions in the Bible, folks. It is right just like it is written. Amen. Leviticus says the coney, that's the rabbit apparently, chews the cud. Scoffers have laughed at this verse and says the rabbit doesn't chew the cud. Oh, there's a great article in Creation Magazine, September to, to November of 1998, about this. Yes, they do. Rabbits eat their food. It goes all the way through, comes out as little rabbit pellets. Then the rabbit will turn around and eat them again. The second time, they get more nutrition out. I can't imagine that, but <laughs> they do, okay? <clears throat> so there is not a contradiction. The rabbit does chew the cud. Um, let's see. How did they have days before God created the sun? That's a good, good question. Uh, the Bible says the sun was made on day four, and yet it says there was days before that, obviously three of them. I think the reason God made the sun on day four instead of on the first day is because God himself is light. Amen. By the way, our day starts at midnight when the sun's not even out. You don't have to have the sun to have a 24-hour day. Amen. If the sun disappeared, how long would our days be? 24 hours, all right? The day is one spin of the earth in relation to anything. So there's, Henry Morris has a good footnote in here uh, in his Defender's Bible about that one. It's uh, about the, how do they have days before the sun. It was God called the light day. The darkness he called night and evening and morning were the first day. The light and the darkness were created, but not the sun. I think he made the sun later on, on day four, because many ancient cultures worshiped the sun. God wanted to make sure his children knew, you don't worship the sun. You have to have the sun. It's a nice thing to have. However, don't worship it. It's not God. I'm God. Amen. I think that's what God was trying to do the way he did this on the fourth day. The Lord is our light. Amen. Okay? God is light, and him is no darkness at all. A couple of more questions here. I went to a McDonald's restaurant with a friend of mine one time, and he said, Kent, uh, I want to tell you a little story. He got two pieces of paper out, stuck them on the table. He labeled one Mr. Flat, and the other one was Mrs. Flat. He said, I want you to imagine we have a Mr. Flat and a Mrs. Flat. They are two-dimensional people. They live in flatland. They have no concept of a third dimension. When Mr. Flat sees Mrs. Flat, what he really sees is a straight line. Now, he can walk around and figure out she's really a rectangle, but he sees one dimension and perceives two dimensions. I said, okay, I got you. I taught geometry. I can figure the concept here. He said, suppose I, as a three-dimensional person, would like to come into their two-dimensional world and let them meet me. How can a three-dimensional person 
ex uh, reveal himself to a two-dimensional person. If I stick my finger through the table of flat land, Mr. Flat's going to come look at it. All he's going to see is a circle. If I stick three fingers through the table over here, Mrs. Flat's going to go say, oh, Ken Hoven is really three circles. Mr. Flat's going to say, no, honey, he's one circle. And they're probably going to split the church and start the church of the three circles, the circles and the church of the one circle. But neither one understands me, right? There's no way you can put a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional world. However, I, as a three-dimensional being, can be right on top of them. And they are unaware of my presence. But I'm actually closer to them than a brother. I can be above them, under them, around them, through them, and they're totally unaware of my presence because I live in three dimensions, length, width, and height. So my friend is telling me the story, and I said, that's a great story. I understand that. He said, now I want you to look at uh, Ephesians chapter 3. That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length and breadth and depth and height. Four dimensions. Did you know God is closer to us than a brother? He's in us, around us, above us, through us. And we're totally unaware of his presence sometimes. But he's right there. The Lord said to Noah, come thou into the ark. He didn't say go into the ark. He said come into the ark. He was in there. That'll preach. Okay. What about the races? Where do the races come from? I always get this question. I'm going to answer it differently now than I did 10 years ago. There aren't any races. There's only one race, the human race. Now, there are different skin colors, but only one race. There's lots of different colors of cows. Would you say they're still one species? Sure. It's just the skin color, that's all. Here's a black family that had three albino children. Skin color is the basic. Now, there are some what we call racial characteristics, okay? The Norwegians with the blonde hair and the blue eyes, the Aborigines with the thin calf muscles, the Indians with the high cheekbones, and the uh, Chinese with the you know, lighter color skin and the little thing in their eye that's slightly different. There are some what we call racial characteristics, but I think they're easily explained, okay? There's a great book about what happened to Noah's children after the flood. If you want to read this one uh, by uh, Bill Cooper, a great book about how they dispersed after the flood. There's four theories about where the different skin colors come from. I'll give you all four. I only believe one of them, but I'll tell you the four theories because these are the ones that are circulating around among Christians. Theory number one says Adam and Eve are medium brown and they produced all the colors in their own family. That could be true. I don't know. God does like variety, obviously. Look around. Okay? Theory number two says the Lord put a mark on Cain, and some people say Cain became the first person of a different color. Now, if you're black, you probably think Adam was black. And if you're white, you think Adam was white. And if you're Chinese, you think Adam was Chinese. Everybody thinks differently about what Adam was like. I happen to know he was Norwegian. Uh, <laughs> born as the Lord of the Hilly Dog. Okay? But uh, I don't think that's a reasonable theory at all, because when you get to the flood, you're back down to one family. Unless one of Noah's kids married somebody of the other race or other color, which is perfectly fine, by the way. There's no scripture against marrying somebody of another color. I was listening to the radio one time. I couldn't believe. They were talking about interracial marriage. Some idiot came on the radio, some call-in guy, said, blacks should not marry whites because the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians that uh, what communion, or no, uh, about unequal yoke together with believers and unbelievers. I thought, how does that fit in? I couldn't get to the phone, or I would have called in and said, fellow, you missed it by a couple of verses. The verse you're looking for is the next one, which says, what communion hath light with darkness? <laughs> but no, there's nothing wrong with marrying somebody of a different color. I'm Norwegian. My wife's Irish. Is that an interracial marriage? Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are conflicts because of that, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, the third theory says, Noah put a curse on Canaan. Now, this is an interesting story when Ham saw Noah naked in the tent, and probably Noah got drunk accidentally. I don't think fermentation was possible before the flood. I suspect it was an accident. At least I'm going to give Noah the benefit of the doubt. When I get to heaven, I don't want him bawling me out for accusing him of something he didn't do, okay? <clears throat> the Bible says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. Now, Ham's the one that did it, but the curse went on Canaan. 
Now, many people teach that Canaan became the first black man, and the black race is supposed to be servants, because the curse was, he's going to be a servant. I don't believe that for a second. But you'll be surprised how many Christians do believe that. Okay? I don't think that theory is reasonable at all. The fourth theory, I think, is probably the most reasonable, is that the Tower of Babel is what caused it. They built this tower to try to defy God's command to go spread out around the world. They, decided, we're, we're staying, we're, they said, we're staying in one place. And they were in defiance of God's command, they built this Tower of Babel. And in Genesis chapter 10, God divided the languages up. But it says, they were divided by their tongue, after their families, in their nations. It wasn't just the tongues that were divided, it was the nations that were divided. And if close inbreeding, when you have to marry somebody closely related to you, generation after generation, unusual traits become very pronounced. And right after the flood, you would have a situation where there would be small groups of folks that all spoke French and small groups that all spoke, you know, German, and they have to marry back to their own family. You'd have to at least speak the language to ask them to marry you, wouldn't you? At least a few words. Anyway. So when you marry close to your family, unusual traits can become pronounced, like the Habsburgs. They had a law for years in Europe. You had to marry royalty. Well, sometimes the only royalty to marry was your sister. Well, a few generations of marrying closely like that, you get some really oddball traits. That's what happens in the animal world. They, they crossbreed very closely to get unusual traits like a chihuahua. Think of it. All that work to create a perfectly useless dog. <laughs> anyway... <clears throat> Genesis chapter 10 says they were divided after the flood. I went through Genesis 10 and tried to count how many original languages there were, and it's a little difficult to count, but it appears like Japheth had about 14 descendants, Ham had about 31, only one of which was Canaan. Okay, so if the curse was on Canaan that he became black, then you got a real problem with your ratio here because all of the Hamites went and settled in Africa, or most of them did. So most ge genealogists will agree that the African race, the black race, is descended from Ham, and yet only one of them was Canaan, so it can't have anything to do with the curse. About 29 descendants came from Shem, a total of about 75. I suspect there's roughly 75 original languages, and if you look at the language groups, English, German, and Danish have many similar roots and probably had a common ancestral language. They're very similar. Spanish, Italian, French, and Latin have thousands of similarities. They could have come from a common language. And I guarantee, if it weren't for telephone and rapid communication like jets going back and forth, English would be broken up into 10 different languages right now. If the people from the South couldn't talk to the people from Brooklyn, within a few generations, they wouldn't understand a the thing they were saying. See the Poity Popo Boyd pushed on the Koib on Toity Toy Street? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Look, I get to travel all over the place. I hear all these different dialects. It's hilarious. I go someplace and I ask them for a rubber band. They say, a what? I show them one. Oh, you mean a gum band? I, was, I forget where I was up in New England someplace. They said, oh, you mean an elastic? We were over in Australia. This lady walks up to my wife. She's holding a baby, and she says, Would you please nurse my baby? <laughs> in Australia, that means, Would you hold it for me, please? I was at the restaurant in Australia, sitting down to eat, and I said to the waiter, uh, waitress, I said, Ma'am, would you please get me a napkin? <gasps> she looked at me. The missionary I was with said, A napkin is a diaper. Don't say that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, anyway, I think we, the languages probably came at the same time as the Tower of Babel, but the Bible clearly teaches that all nations are of one blood, and there is no scriptural reason to be a racist. And if you'll send money to a missionary to go across the ocean and win a black man to Christ, and you won't go across the street to win a black man, you're a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. The Bible says we all have one father. Why do we deal treacherously, every man against his brother? Okay, one of the questions came in. What about cloning? Interesting. The sheep Dolly that was cloned, according to Kids Discover magazine, 
Dolly was cloned at a cost of $50,000 after 277 failures. A nucleus was transplanted into a fertilized egg and placed in a surrogate sheep. Nucleus came from a four-year-old sheep, and Dolly is acting about four years older than she's supposed to be. She's going to die early. I would like to point out that a cost of $50,000 for one sheep is pretty high. The sheep can do it much quicker and cheaper. <laughs> They've been doing fine for a long time. Just leave them alone, okay? Uh, what they did here was a very interesting and, you know, ex and neat genetic trick, but they didn't create anything new. They took existing DNA material and transplanted it. That's all. I suspect they've already been cloning humans for some time. I don't know that, but I suspect that. You might want to get uh, the, uh, uh, call the phone number 1-800-K-HOUSE for Koinonia House, K-HOUSE-1. That's Chuck Missler's uh, organization in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. He's got some interesting stuff on cloning and on UFOs and how this ties in. He's got a great book called Alien Invasion. You might want to get that. K-House 1. Uh, I don't know his website. Koinonia House is this, however you spell Koinonia. Uh, okay, what about the crossing of the Red Sea? Don't you think if an entire army drowned in the sea, they would find some relics of this? Well, I believe they did. In Exodus chapter 40, God told Moses to go and camp by the sea. Then in chapter, I'm sorry, in Exodus chapter 14, it says the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. Well, if the waters are a wall beside them, this is not just wading across the water. Some Bible scholars and some Bible school teachers will teach they went across the Reed Sea and it was just ankle deep water. Well, now think about it. How is Pharaoh's entire army going to drown in ankle-deep water? <laughs> did God, or did Pharaoh just tell them all, okay, everybody lay down and don't get up till I tell you? <laughs> no. <laughs> it wasn't the Reed Sea, okay? The waters were a wall unto them. And the Bible says God took off the chariot wheels. Well, no, that's kind of interesting. He covered the chariots with the water. I mean, the Bible's pretty clear about this. If you look at the area right there, Egypt, when they left Egypt, they had to go across what we often call the Sinai Peninsula. By the way, it should not be called the Sinai Peninsula. There are two bodies of water on each side of this Sinai Peninsula. They're both branches of the Red Sea. The one on the left is called the Gulf of Suez. The one on the right is called the Gulf of Aqaba. Apparently, when they left Egypt, they went clear across this peninsula and crossed the Gulf of Aqaba. You can look at almost any Bible map and you will see there's a mountain at the bottom right here called Mount Sinai, question mark. Somebody about, uh, I don't know, a thousand years ago picked that mountain and said, I think that's Mount Sinai. Some, some lady picked it, I believe. I don't remember the whole story about it. it. It's not Mount Sinai, folks. Mount Sinai's not even in the Sinai Peninsula. The fact of the matter is they went all the way across the Sinai Peninsula and crossed the Gulf of Aqaba over here. If you look at this area from a satellite, here's the Gulf of Aqaba down here on the lower part. Here's the Gulf of Suez on the upper part. This is kind of a strange view, a little bit from the north. Right here is a little bitty dot. You see that uh, white dot right there? Apparently, that is where they crossed because that is actually a gigantic beach. Leading up to the beach, there is a pathway through the mountains. And on that pathway, you can go there today and walk down that same pathway through the mountains. It ends up on the beach. There are giant boulders that are pushed out of the way. There's a trail right down the middle. You'd have to do that for your wagons, do you know? When you get on this giant beach, it's big enough to hold two or three million people. At the bottom end of this beach, at the south end down here, years ago, a good friend of mine who just died, uh, Ron Wyatt, was a good friend of mine, he found this pillar down there. They dragged it out and set it up. Some of the engravings were still visible. The pillar says, basically, this pillar was set up by King Solomon to commemorate the crossing of the Red Sea. So they went across the Gulf of Aqaba and found another pillar just like it on the other side. They didn't cross the Gulf of Suez, they crossed the Gulf of Aqaba. Here's the uh, map showing the underwater uh, depth, the depth of the water. It's extremely deep, like 5,000 feet deep until you get right to this point where that beach is. There's a natural underwater bridge right there. It's only 900 feet deep, which is still plenty to drown in, but. 
the water parted and they walked across this natural land bridge underneath. The Bible says the water was, the, the dirt was congealed. It was hardened like a dry sponge. They weren't even getting muddy going through there. Amen. And the pillar of fire was behind them. Here's the natural underwater land bridge where they went across. So on the other side, or as they went down into this uh, water, they went scuba diving out as far as they could go, they found chariot wheels with no chariots attached. Gold-plated chariot wheels. You can't pick them up because it's just a thin gold plating and the wood's rotted out and so they crumble. They also found human and horse skeletons with coral growing all over them. It was the four-spoke chariot. They found four-spoke and eight-spoke chariot wheels, exactly what they used in the 18th dynasty in Egypt at that time. Which means Mount Sinai is over here in Saudi Arabia. If you look at any map, you look over there, it says Jabal Allahs, which means Mountain of Laws. The Bible says uh, Sinai is in Arabia. You know what people ought to do is read their Bible a little more carefully. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there, okay? <laughs> Just, we ought to read that book. This mountain over there in Saudi Arabia, the top of it is still black like it burned. At the bottom, it's all fenced off now. The Saudi government has fenced it off, and they've got it marked as an archaeological site, middle of the desert. But there's an altar down there with calves on it. All sorts of engravings on these altar, this altar. From the top of Mount Sinai, you can look down across the valley, and uh, see not only this altar, you can see the place where they camped, the encampment site. Exodus 17, the Lord said, Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and their water shall come out of it, that the people may drink. How many seen the pictures in the back of Bibles where they have everybody standing there with a cup? Do you know how long that would take to water two million people? <laughs> Actually, the water came pouring out of there. This boulder right here is 54 feet tall, taller than a five-story building. As you walk up closer to it, you'll see it is split right in half, and water came pouring out of there. The erosion marks are incredible. That's probably the rock that Moses smote where the water came out. And if you pan out over the area, I recommend you get Ron Wyatt's video about this. Uh, just get his website, wyattmuseum.com, and you can order the video his discoveries. Now, I don't agree with Ron and everything, okay? And he's in heaven now, and he knows better on a few things. <laughs> but uh, but he, was, he's a, he was a good friend of mine, a godly man, and I believe he found the crossing of the Red Sea. The Bible says fire and brimstone fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, Ron also happened to find, I believe, the correct place for Sodom and Gomorrah. There are some cities, you can't even tell it's a city until you're five miles away. When you get too close, it looks just like solid ash. But when you get five miles away, you realize that's a city that completely burned and turned to ash. Sulfur balls are all over that area by the millions. I have some at home. Pure sulfur, about the size of a golf ball with a crust on the outside. It just peppered in all this ash. That city was actually bombarded by fire and brimstone, just like the Bible says. This is probably one of the uh, temples that they had in front of the, around the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. So what about the unicorn? Where does that fit into the Bible? The Bible mentions a unicorn several times. In Numbers chapter 23, it says he has the strength of a unicorn. The strength of a unicorn in Numbers chapter 24. Job chapter 20, 39 talks about, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? The descriptions of unicorn in the Bible indicate he was strong and he was untamable. He wouldn't stay by your crib. You couldn't tame him to, you know, plow your fields. I think we've been so indoctrinated with the idea of a horse with a horn that it's probably going to be impossible to get that idea out of our mind. But I don't think that's what it was. I suspect it was some type of dinosaur, maybe a monoclonius or a styracosaurus, something like that, because generally people don't train re reptiles for anything. You don't train alligators to jump through hoops and stuff like that, okay? They're just not too bright but they're extremely strong. So I, that's my theory, is probably it's referring to some type of dinosaur, but I don't know. The skipping like a calf and a young uh, unicorn could be referring to one of these fast-moving type dinosaurs. I don't know, but that's about all the verses I know in the Bible that deal with the unicorn. Okay, next question. How did Noah take care of all those animals on the ark? 
Well, first place, there's only about 8,000 different kinds of animals. And Noah brought babies, I suspect. He only had to bring two of each kind. The Bible's real clear about that. He didn't bring all the varieties we have today, just two of the basic kinds. And he probably brought babies. And he only brought those in whose nostrils was the breath of life, which means no insects. They don't have nostrils. They breathe through their skin. So if you only have two of each kind, you have babies, you have air-breathing, land-dwelling animals, and many animals hibernate or get very lethargic during stormy weather. But when, it's, when it's storming, my dog just lays around. Well, he just lays around all the time anyway, but <laughs> he really lays around <laughs> when it's stormy, right? And I mean, if they can't go very far, God was with him in the ark, okay, so it's not a problem. Okay, a few more questions. Why did God make poisonous snakes in a perfect world? That's a good question. Carl Baugh did a, a good study about this. He found if you take poisonous snakes and put them under hyperbaric conditions with increased air pressure, increased electromagnetic field, they're not poisonous. By the way, a lot of missionaries are being taught now to carry a stun gun with them when you're out in the woods because if you get bit by a poisonous snake, if you take a stun gun or a high voltage source like a spark plug out of your lawnmower or chainsaw or car engine, if you get bit on the arm by a poisonous snake, pull a spark plug off your car, pull the wire off, hold it next to your arm, and have somebody hit the key for a few seconds. <laughs> It'll go zap. It takes the poison that the snake injected and it neutralizes it. Dr. Uh, Roger, whatever his name is here, from Ecuador, treated 300 cases of snake bite. The pain is gone in 15 minutes if shock is applied within 30 minutes. High voltage shock will neutralize it. Same thing with a brown recluse spider, or a lot of poisonous spiders. You just shock the injury site. They say if it's been more than 30 minutes, you have to shock the place where you got bit, plus the opposite side of the limb, plus halfway to the heart. It neutralizes the poison. So it may be that the uh, snake venom served a different purpose before the flood. I don't know. I have to find out when we get to heaven. Okay, we've got time for a few more here. What about the Ark of the Covenant? The Bible says in Jeremiah that they came and stole the basins and the fire pans and the bowls and the spoons and the cups. It names all the things they stole away to take back to Babylon. But it doesn't mention the Ark. Why wouldn't it mention the Ark of the Covenant? And then in the book of Ezra, when they brought all the stuff back, it mentions all the little detail stuff, you know, the spoons and the forks and everything else. Nebuchadnezzar took these things out. And when they brought them back, they had the knives, the basins of gold, the silver basins. It mentions all these detail stuff. Why doesn't it mention the ark? Well, be probably because it was never taken out. The Bible says Uzziah made stones, I made uh, machines to cast stones. He made engines to cast great stones. He probably invented the catapult, or certainly perfected the catapult to fling these great stones. Nebuchadnezzar comes, and he's going to attack Israel. So Nebuchadnezzar built a wall outside of the city wall. They had two walls, a wall around the city, and then you got a distance, however far they could throw these stones, let's say a quarter mile, they built a wall outside the range of the stones. So now they're going to keep the pe people in there and starve them to death. Well, apparently Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant outside of the city wall, inside the siege wall, and hid it. God told Jeremiah to tell the king to surrender because you're going to lose. The king chose not to obey, and sure enough, they lost and got slaughtered and everything else. But meanwhile, Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant outside. In 1 Chronicles, it says, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the Ark, and God smote him, and he died. The children of Israel learned, don't touch the Ark unless you're qualified, right? So um, Ron Wyatt, again, a guy who died, uh, was a friend of mine, and I get blasted by some creationists because they even mention Ron Wyatt. But look, those who blast me about him didn't go talk to him personally like I did. I went and talked to him. Get, let, get, let him tell his side of the story. Ron said he was walking on the north side of Jerusalem, and he, his, he saw this, there's a garbage dump there. And he said his mouth started speaking, and his arm lifted up, and he said, that's Jeremiah's grotto, the Ark of the Covenant's down there. His friend said, what? He said, I just said the Ark of the Covenant's down there. He said, it can't be. Let me go home and study this. He went home and studied all the scriptures, found out that the Ark apparently never left Jerusalem. The story knows it doesn't mention it leaving. So Ron spent the next eight years digging through this garbage dump. He got down a little ways, and he found the place where Jesus was crucified. 
There are three places etched out into the wall where there are places where they put a sign uh, for the, in the different, three different languages for the person who was being crucified. As Ron kept digging, he got down into this cave system and found the Ark of the Covenant. He told the Jewish authorities about it. They came, looked at it, and said, thank you, we're not going to touch it. And it's still there. Uh, the guy who is building the harps that they're going to use in the temple service, and they've already got all the harps made now, he stopped at my house because he saw my videotapes. He was coming through Pensacola. He said, Brother Hovind, I love your tapes. And he came and did a harp concert for us and all that. He's a tremendous uh, harpist. But uh, I asked him, I said, hey, brother, uh, I understand they're getting all the stuff ready for the temple. He said, oh, yeah. He said they got the high priest garment. They figured out how to make that. A computer told them how to make it with a seamless garment. They couldn't figure it out without the computer. They've already got all the harps. They've already got everything. I said, what about the Ark of the Covenant? He said, oh, he said, I asked the Jewish authorities about that. What are you going to do about the Ark of the Covenant? They said, don't worry about it. We've got it taken care of. They don't want to announce to the world, hey, we've got the Ark of the Covenant, because the average Orthodox Jew is just about that close to going to tear down the Mosque of Omar, which is going to make the Arabs really upset. And so it's kind of a politically sensitive thing that they're not talking much about, but they do have the Ark of the Covenant. And you can get a hold of Ron Wyatt, wyattmuseum.com, and get information on that if you want, or call uh, Richard Reeves took over for him. He's also a good friend of mine, and they've got stuff on that. Okay, what about Bigfoot? That's a question I get asked all the time. What about Bigfoot? Well, my brother has two of them. <laughs> I have met eight people who have seen a Bigfoot. I interviewed them. They all tell the same basic story. It's big, it's hairy, and it stinks. I've seen some of them on Harleys. <laughs> I like motorcycles, okay? I'm not against motorcycles. I've, I've had about 70 or 80 of them, I guess. I've seen the video, the Patterson film about Bigfoot. I've met lots of folks that have seen one. I'll have to say, I don't know. I wish I did. I've heard all the theories. I, some people think it's an unidentified species of North American ape. I don't know. Some people think it's some of the hippies from the 60s that haven't come in yet. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to say, I just don't know. I wish I did. Somebody else answer that one for me. Okay, what about UFOs? Again, I have to say, I don't know the answer. I've read some amazing books. I can tell you some books to read, and you can decide for yourself. If you want to learn about UFOs, you might want to get this book by uh, David Lewis from New Leaf Press. 800-999-3777. It's an amazing book about UFOs. There's a condensed version of it on the same phone number. This book, UFO 666. If you really want to get into it, you'd call 1-800-K-HOUSE-1, that's Chuck Missler's organization, and get his book called Alien Encounters. Tremendous book about UFOs. And so is this one, The Cosmic Conspiracy. Who was it told me before the service they were reading Cosmic Conspiracy? Yes. Fascinating book by Stan Deo about UFOs. I've been on the Art Bell Show as a guest. He has all sorts of people that are UFO experts on there. I've read about as much about it as I care to read. I don't claim to have an answer. But it certainly appears that there is demonic activity to prepare people psychologically for the rapture. If there are UFOs, it doesn't mean they're coming from other planets. It might be right here. It might be top secret government craft. It might be demonic activity. I don't know. I have to leave that one for somebody else. Okay, what about the mark of the beast? We cover the mark of the beast uh, a little bit on videotape number five, uh, how the mark of the beast fits in. The Bible says he caused everybody to receive a mark, and you couldn't buy or sell without the mark. It appears that the barcode was the forerunner to this because the two digits they used to represent the beginning, middle, and end of every barcode is the same as the two skinny lines for the number six. Just interesting. I've read a lot about the uh, barcode and the mark of the beast. I can tell you some numbers of people you can get a hold of if you want more information on this. Some of the old original barcodes at the bottom, when you scanned it in, it had an F and an H down there, apparently for forehead and hand. Interesting. You can get pets injected with microchips. How many have heard of that before? You can get microchips in the hand or in the forehead, just like the Bible prophesied is going to happen. That's probably the mark of the beast technology, certainly. You might want to get a hold of Carl Sanders in Arkansas or Dean Martin in Pensacola or Terry Cook in uh, California, I believe Terry lives. They've all done tremendous work on the uh, mark of the beast. This fellow has one in his arm. When he walks in, his, his, his lights turn on, turns on the coffee pot. His whole house is computerized. 
And as he walks past, this little mark activates, this little microchip activates his house to do different things based upon how he's got it programmed. Uh, Carl Sanders is a friend of mine. He's got some tremendous uh, videos and, and material out on the mark of the beast, how from the, going from the Greek word stigma to prick, uh, how it's put inside the skin, not on the skin. And Carl, Marx, or, I mean, uh, Carl Sanders is one of the guys who actually helped invent the little microchip. I think it'd be a great way we could mark known sex offenders. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. aye. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of technology, things happening now, like HARP technology, H-A-A-R-P, High Altitude Aurora Research Project, where they're actually able to uh, do some crazy things to the weather. You might want to get that book, Angels Don't Play This Harp, now, and Global Warming. Now, the author that wrote the book is a New Age fella. He believes it's a great thing, you know, the technology, but he doesn't understand. With the satellites they have up now, they can spy on people. The, in Europe, they're using them to make sure nobody has more cows than they're allowed to have, and not planting fields, and not allowed to plant. I mean, it's unreal. This is back from 92. The technology was that good back then. It's really good now. Little microchips, just a few centimeters long, are being made by the millions. You can get all sorts of things marked with these chips. I suspect that's probably going to be uh, the mark of the beast, something very close to that. Another question came in. Uh, how can we say the pre-flood world says the animals were vegetarian, Genesis 1:29, and yet some animals are caught in the act of predation? I assume what this person means by this question is they find teeth marks on some of the bones of animals that are buried. That, of course, doesn't mean they were eating them. It might mean they were fighting for high ground during the flood. High ground would become scarce, valuable real estate as the flood water comes up. Plus, the reason we had the flood is because people weren't being obedient to God. So the fact that God told them what to do does not mean they were doing it 1,600 years later. So I don't know that uh, everything was, was obedient to God like they should have been uh, before the flood. Uh, question, if the world's climate was spring-like before the flood, why were the woolly mammoths woolly? Good question. You may want to get um, uh, Walt Brown's book out there on the table called In the Beginning. He covers this in great detail. The woolly mammoths were not designed for cold weather. A lot of animals in the jungle have long hair, okay? And if you live in a perfect world, like let's, let's assume that the world when God first made it was tropical, 60, 70, 80 degrees most of the time. Long hair is neither an advantage nor a disadvantage. It's just a decoration. The woolly mammoths do not have sebaceous glands at the uh, root of the hair, so they wouldn't have survived in cold weather because they don't have oil-producing glands, which means the hair would get matted with water and freeze. So the woolly mammoths, even though they were woolly, they were not designed for uh, cold weather. And how long did Adam and Eve live in the garden before they sinned? Good question. The Bible doesn't give us the answer. It gives us a few clues. The Bible says uh, Adam and Eve were 130 when Seth was born. That's the first clue given. Before that, they had Cain and Abel, but no dates are given. We also know from Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, that it was, everything was perfect at the end of the seven days. So they didn't sin during the first week. They were out of the garden by the time Cain and Abel were born, but no dates are given. So they really could have been in the garden for a hundred years. We don't know, the Bible doesn't say, but I don't think God made them and they blew it first week. I think God made them and they were having a wonderful time serving, praising God, living in His beautiful creation, and Satan got jealous of them praising God and decided they should praise Him instead. This may have taken a hundred years. The Bible simply doesn't say. Question. Uh, is there a face on Mars? Uh, there's some junk we've put up there. <laughs> now, I think the face on Mars thing is baloney. It's just uh, uh, a shadow on a mountain. I've seen all the pictures of that, you know, and it's just simply an unusual mountain formation, so I don't think there's a face up there. Question, how do you go about setting up a debate? If you can find an opponent for a debate, God bless you, I'd be glad to come. <coughs> It's very difficult to find an opponent. They just won't debate against a creationist. You can watch some of my debates on video and see why. I mean, <laughs> think about it. If you had to defend the idea that we all came from a rock, <laughs> would you be willing to do that publicly? <laughs> it's very hard to find an opponent. 
but I'll be glad to come. I offer, I say, look, I'll take on any five at a time. Get your top five evolutionists, and I'll take them on all by myself with half my brain tied behind my back. <laughs> and I'll beat them. It's not because I'm smarter than them. It's because I'm right and they're wrong. Amen. Very easy to win a debate in that situation. Next question. Is the sun shrinking? Good question. For years in my seminar, I used uh, as one of the proofs of a young universe the fact that the sun is shrinking, and this proves there's a limit of less than the billions of years like they tell us. I don't use it anymore, though I think it's still valid. The sun is obviously burning. You know, walk outside and take a look. You will see it is burning. As it burns, it's losing 5 million tons per second. It's on quite a weight loss program. The observations show us for the last few hundred years, ever since they've been able to measure the sun, based on a number of factors, like they will use the time it takes the moon to go across during an eclipse and time it, and then you can use that to calculate the diameter of the sun. There are several things they can do to calculate the diameter. B bottom line is, though, it appears that the sun has been shrinking consistently for 300 years at the rate of about 5 feet per hour. Now, we don't know that the rate's always been the same. Matter of fact, we know if the sun were larger, the surface area to volume ratio would change, so the rate would, of shrinkage would be different. But rather than argue about the sun shrinking, though it is, I think it's equally important that the sun is losing its mass. It's losing 5 million tons a second, which eventually is going to affect the gravitational pull. So if you want to believe the Earth and the sun have been the right distance apart for life to be here, while the sun is consistently losing material and losing its pull on the earth, and you think it's kept the right distance for billions of years, I think, you know, God bless you, but I think you've got an awful lot more faith than I do. I think it's more reasonable to say because the sun is losing mass, it is losing diameter, therefore it cannot be billions of years old. So that's, I'll stand by that. I think the sun is certainly shrinking, though I don't use it as a proof that the earth is 6,000 years old. The, t the t two basic theories of how the sun burns. It's burning by gravitational collapse is one theory, or it's burning by nuclear fusion. If it's burning by nuclear fusion, it could burn for billions of years. If it's burning by gravitational collapse, it could not burn for billions of years. It would be much shorter than that. They've done some studies because if it's burning by nuclear fusion, it should be producing neutrinos. And neutrinos, when they go through dry cleaning fluid, produce argon gas. So they buried a big tank of dry cleaning fluid in the bottom of a mountain in an old mine, and after years and years of watching it, it had almost zero argon gas in it. So they detected very few neutrinos. So they kind of shot the theory about this nuclear fusion in the foot, but they still believe it, and it still could be burning that way. I don't know. But the fact is, so far the evidence is not complete, and so I don't think it's a, it's a finished case yet. But the sun is certainly burning, and it's losing fuel. And the evolutionist who says it's billions of years old does not answer the question, where did it come from? Where did its energy come from? Who got it started burning? I mean, who lit the fuse, okay? So they don't answer all the questions. Okay, a couple more. What do you think about giving blood or organ donating in relation to the Bible? The Bible says the Jews were commanded not to eat blood. I don't understand how the Jehovah's Witness translate that to saying you shouldn't give blood. It's not eating it. There's no question, though, that a lot of diseases are spread in the blood, and of course, if you don't take a blood transfusion, you can't get somebody else's disease. By the same token, if you're dying from loss of blood and you don't take a blood transfusion, you will die much faster from the loss of blood. So I'm not against giving blood. I'm not against giving organs. When I die, I have no further plans for them. So you may take whatever you'd like, okay? Please wait till I die, though. Next question. My son came home from school, concerned that his teacher made a statement saying that the blood from monkeys is 99.9% .9 the same as that of humans. Is this true, and what else should we know about this? Probably the teacher was referring to the fact that the DNA <clears throat> from monkeys is very similar, 99% similar to humans. That doesn't prove a common ancestor, it proves a common designer. Amen. The same guy designed all the animals. If you took an encyclopedia and only 1% of the words were different from two encyclopedias, you could make it say something totally different by changing 1% of the words. 1% of, of human DNA is a gigantic amount of information. I believe it's about 150 uh, books worth of information. The 1% is. All you gotta do is stand a few feet away and look at humans and monkeys, you'll notice there's a few differences, <laughs> depending which humans you pick. 
but uh, the similarities prove a common designer. They don't prove a common ancestor. We cover a lot of that in the DNA sequencing and things on videotape number four of our series. Question, if vitamin B17 has been shown to work on cancer cells, why is it not available in the market? Why can't you go buy it? And which foods contain a lot of vitamin B17? We cover that on videotape number two about vitamin B17. It's found in the seeds to almost every fruit. The highest concentrate, I believe, is in apricot seeds. If you want to find out why it's not available on the market, I suggest you read the book World Without Cancer. The first half of the book deals with the biology of how cancer works. The second half deals with the politics of why the cure has been suppressed. There's more money being made from cancer than is being spent on cancer, people dying. More people make a living from cancer than are dying from cancer. And if the cure was discovered to be a vitamin tonight, tomorrow morning, how much hospital space and how much hospital equipment would be obsolete? And how much money would they lose? Remember the Bible says, love of money is the root of all evil. Just read the book, World Without Cancer. Question, if the dinosaurs were plant eating, why did the T-Rex have such large teeth? Uh, many animals with large, sharp teeth are vegetarians. We cover that on video number two. Uh, the fruit bat, for instance, has ferocious looking teeth. He lives on fruit. T-Rex teeth, when they find them and look under the microscope, they find the cracks in the enamel have chlorophyll stains. The chlorophyll is found in plants. T-Rex, as ferocious as he looked, was a plant eater. Now, Hollywood needs a bad guy to sell their movies, and he looks like a bad guy, so he tried out for the part and got it. But he was a plant eater, not a meat eater. All right, let's stop right there. I get questions all the time. Feel free to look on my website, drdino.com. We have a large frequently asked questions section there. And as we get more questions, we add to that section all the time. And I uh, hope this has been a blessing to you. If you have any other questions you'd like answered, I sure don't know everything, but I'd like to study this subject and I'd be glad to try to give it an answer. You might want to check some other websites. There's a website called creationism.org, which is kind of the mother of all websites because it leads you to about 150 other creation websites some of which are not any good, some of which are better than, some are better than others, but that would be a good one to lead you to into this study. And it's a wonderful study. God's Word is correct. God made the world. He owns it. He destroyed it with a flood. This is His world. He can wreck it if He wants. And He came down to redeem us from our sins 2,000 years ago, and Jesus is coming back pretty soon. And if you're not saved, you're going to hell you ought to get saved. Amen. If you are saved, you ought to get busy because nothing else is going to matter after we all go to heaven. It's not going to matter how much money you've got and how, much, how big a car you drive. What's going to matter is what have you done for Jesus Christ. Amen. So I'd encourage you to forget the rest of the stuff and just serve God with your life. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you've